Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, a new internal report says the Justice Department massively overstated its successes in targeting mortgage fraud, while in fact ranking it as a low priority for investigation. The Justice Department's inspector general says despite playing a central role in the nation's financial crisis, mortgage fraud was deemed either a low priority or not a priority at all. In one instance, Attorney General Eric Holder claimed to have filed lawsuits on behalf of homeowner victims for losses totaling more than $1 billion, but the actual amount was 91 percent less, around $95 million. This comes as a recently revealed internal Wells Fargo document appears to guide lawyers step by step on how to fabricate missing documents to foreclose on homeowners. Wells Fargo is the country's largest mortgage servicer and services some nine million million home loans. State and federal regulators are now focusing on the allegations in the lawsuit brought by Linda Torelli, who joins us now. She's an attorney representing clients being foreclosed on by Wells Fargo. Earlier this month, she discovered the Wells Fargo manual on how to produce missing documents to foreclose on homeowners. She's a partner at the Garvey, Torelli and Kushner law firm in White Plains, New York. In Minneapolis, we're joined by Kevin Whalen, campaign director for the Home Defenders League, a national movement of underwater homeowners and allies who are Organized to keep people in their homes and demand accountability. Wells Fargo declined Democracy Now!'s interview request, saying they're in, quote, quiet period, pending the announcement of their quarterly earnings. Welcome you both to Democracy Now!, Linda Torelli. Let's begin with you. Uh, can you describe this manual, how you got it, and what it reveals? Absolutely. Uh, the manual that I have, it's actually entitled the Wells Fargo Home Mortgage Foreclosure Attorney Procedural Manual version 1. And it says on it that it's uh, last published 224-2012. Mind you, the National Mortgage Settlement Agreement was announced a week prior on 219-2012. Uh, uh, the way I obtained it, it was actually sitting right out there on the Internet, of all things. Um, a colleague of mine through a um, Max Garner's bankruptcy boot camp, which, which I am a, a member, an active member, um, gave it to me and said, hey, I found this on, online and I know you're doing a lot of Wells Fargo cases. Maybe you can use this. Um, reading it, my, my jaw just dropped. It's, it, it, as, I, as I see it, it's clearly outlining procedures, not just for the $12 an hour robo-signers that we've heard about all these years, but for the lawyers who need to be held accountable to a much higher degree. It's, it's a manual for the lawyers to actually fabricate documents, as I see it, um, and request that documents that are lacking be fabricated by Wells Fargo. It's absolutely appalling. Well, you know, we've had on, on Democracy Now! a couple of times uh, the Brooklyn Supreme Court Judge Arthur Schacht, who, who uh, raised a campaign of, not only over the robo-signers in many cases that he had before his court, but also over the bank officials and the attorneys who participated in this fraud. Uh, and there have been several judges in different parts of the country who have raised these issues. Uh, how do you think this advances uh, the whole uh, issue of going after, uh, having the smoking gun to go after these companies? Well, I I think that um, judges cannot make determinations based on suspicion, okay? This is the first and only internal document that I'm aware of that clearly outlines the fraud, and that's how I put it in, in my um, allegations to the court. And we are very, very fortunate in New York to have a number of proactive judges who get it. But unfortunately, they're few and far between across the country. Um, my hope is that judges as wonderful as Arthur Schack and as, um, as great as many of our federal judges, I do appear mostly in federal courts, um, that they will be proactive, they will take this seriously, and start to question Wells Fargo on their procedures. I want to read a bit from the Wells Fargo document. Um, in this section called Note Endorsement, it says, quote, if the blank endorsement is in the file for an original state, execute the endorsement, send the original document to the attorney, and complete the ZO2 step. Can you explain what this means? Sure. I take that to mean that if there is actually an endorsement that exists, um, they need to endorse it. But is the party— And by in endorsement, you mean? Sign it over. Oh. OK, um, but the question is, do they have the, the authority to sign it over? Is it an authorized endorsement? Who's signing it over? As the lawyer, I would need to know that before proceeding with a foreclosure. Uh, if it's a document that needs to, if it was a note that needed to be um, endorsed under a pooling and servicing agreement, which is followed by every um, securitized trust, and most of these loans, let's face it, are owned by securitized trust in some form or another, um, they should have been endorsed long before the foreclosure was ever started, at the time that it was actually acquired by the trust, or allegedly acquired by the trust. So this manual talks about how to fabricate a document Absolutely. that you don't have, that you need. 
That that that's that's how I'm reading it. That Wells Fargo would need Ex exactly that's to what foreclose on the house. Exactly right. That's how, exactly how I'm reading it. I'm reading it to say that it's not just when there is a blank endorsement, fill in the blank, but sometimes when there it, there's actually a procedure in here, um, as I read it, for when there's um, no endorsement. Okay, um, go ahead and, and endorse the note. Just request that the note be endorsed. And that's what we call in, in, um, in, in, our, in our area of law a tada endorsement. Um, the bank produces a copy of a note, just for example, that has no endorsement on it. And then when we ask about it and say, gee, this note's not endorsed to your client, how is it that you're, you know, you're, you're bringing foreclosure? And they say, oh, here, use this version. Ta-da, now we have an endorsement. And it's always a rubber stamp that you or I could go to Staples and purchase for nine ninety five. You also, uh, one of your cases came uh, across a document uh, which was purportedly from an official of Washington Mutual Bank in 2010, but Washington Mutual didn't exist in 2010 because it had collapsed back in 2008. 2008, that's right. Um, that document was signed by um, by Mr. John Kennedy, in, um, who works for Wells Fargo, or worked for Wells Fargo at the time. Uh, and in this procedure manual, there's actually a procedure for obtaining what's called an assignment of mortgage, okay? So um, basically, as I I'm reading this procedure it's saying, gee, if you need an assignment, um, the attorney should request it through the document um, department, and then magically one will appear for you. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing. The people in, that work for Wells Fargo in these various departments, when they receive a request from an attorney, they take that as permission to actually sign something um, without doing any research whatsoever. How is it, as you pointed out, uh, we can have anything assigned from a company that ceased to exist two years prior? It just simply makes no sense. That document's fabricated. And in that particular case, I will point out, the judge actually deemed that document to be a fraudulent document on record. I remember when Congressman Marcy Kaptur was standing on the floor of the House and telling homeowners, stay in your homes and demand that they produce the note, produce the note. I wanted to go to Eric Schneiderman. Um, last May, the New, York Attorney the New York Attorney General announced plans to sue Bank of America and Wells Fargo for violating the terms of a settlement aimed at curbing foreclosure abuses. The $26 billion settlement was reached in 2012 between five major banks and 49 attorneys general. It provided basic protections for homeowners, such as requiring banks to notify them about missing documents within a certain time period. But Schneiderman said the banks had violated the terms of the settlement with impunity. At the news conference in May, he lifted a massive sheaf of papers to show the hundreds of complaints issued by homeowners against the banks. Two of the participating servicers, Wells Fargo and Bank of America, have flagrantly violated their obligations under the settlement. I've sent a letter to the monitoring committee, the body that oversees the implementation of the National Mortgage Servicing Settlement, notifying them of my intention to sue both Wells Fargo and Bank of America for noncompliance with servicing standards spelled out in the settlement. This enforcement action, which is the first taken under the settlement, is based on 339 individual complaints from New Yorkers against these two banks in just the last six months. Linda Torelli, can you explain what happened with this case? Um, yes. I, well, first of all, I want to point out, um, and very much to Mr. Schneiderman's credit, within four hours of the New York Post um, uh, you know, writing the article exposing this document, within four hours, I received not only a phone call, but an email from Attorney Schneiderman's office. Um, and we had a long discussion about it. I also received um, the phone call um, and an email from the New York State um, Division of, uh, of um, Financial Services. So I'm hoping that they are now launching new investigations. Basically, to put, as, as I understand Mr. Scheinman's point, um, Wells Fargo was signing off on the National Mortgage Settlement Agreement out of one side of its mouth. Out of the other side, they were republishing their manual to say, hey, we're going to continue business as usual, all right? Throw some money at it, it's done, quiet down the homeowners, and we'll just continue business as usual. And that's what we're seeing. That's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, Kevin Whalen from the uh, Home Defenders League, can you put this in a national context of the mortgage crisis? Here we are now, six years uh, into the, uh, the, the home mortgage crisis that crashed the entire economy. Uh, absolutely. Thanks for having me uh, very much today. Uh, the, we, we hear every time there's an uptick in real estate prices in some parts of the country that the foreclosure crisis or the mortgage crisis is over. Um, and certainly Wells Fargo and the big banks are, are back to making record, pro record profits and feel like everything is great. Uh, but foreclosures are still tearing apart many communities, particularly communities of color that were targeted for predatory uh, and subprime lending. Um, and one in five American American homeowners is still underwater, meaning they owe more on their house than the, the house is currently worth. 
so we've made the banks whole um, without effectively curbing uh, their abusive practices uh, to give homeowners the runaround, to use falsified documents, um, and to uh, rush toward foreclosure when there's a perfectly good way to reach a different settlement. Uh, and they've not done enough uh, to uh, make homeowners whole, um, including doing principal reduction uh, that they promised to do under settlements. And can you respond to this latest news about um, the attorney general, uh, the office, making a low priority or no priority at all going after these mortgage lenders? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's. Uh, the news is no surprise to people that have been fighting for closure in communities around the country. Uh, we work with 25 community groups um, and are an at-large organization, so people can come find us at homedefendersleague.org and uh, get on a phone call and learn how to start a petition and fight for their homes. Uh, and uh, people have been, uh, you know, in, in cases all over the place, uh, trying to uh, stave off foreclosure. Um, we had a family in New Jersey uh, last month, uh, uh, Paulette McQueen and her 86-year-old um, mom, who had missed one mortgage payment in 2010, went to Wells Fargo the next month with both checks in hand, and Wells Fargo wouldn't take their money, and started a three-year campaign to take their house uh, that was only resolved when people in 13 cities delivered petitions to Wells Fargo's offices around the country. Uh, and they finally got a call back and are going to work out a solution to be able to stay in their home. Um, it was all a week before a sheriff's sale. Um, so it's, it, you know, families that are facing this um, know both that the housing crisis isn't over and that nothing has happened uh, that's on a, a deep enough or broad enough scale to make the banks uh, fearful or uh, sorry for uh, either the harm they've done or uh, change their behavior in fundamental ways. Now, there are some localities, some local governments that have tried to uh, intervene themselves uh, in uh, trying to beat back the, the, uh, the crisis of people being kicked out of their homes. Could you talk about some of those examples? Yeah, yeah there, one thing that's, uh, uh, we know there's something to it, um, because the banks, uh, led by Wells Fargo, are especially uh, panicked and angry about this solution. Um, but in Richmond, California, I think you had the, the mayor of Richmond, Gail McLaughlin, on, on the show before, um, has been a city that's led the way, and more, many more are going to follow, um, to enact principal reduction, meaning uh, resetting loans to their current market value on the local level. Um, and this is exciting because uh, while these uh, federal agencies like the Justice Department um, are too often captive of the big banks, people can, can use democracy and, and win on the local level sometimes. Uh, the concept for this particular program is that uh, cities would work with uh, other investors to buy the loans at their fair market value on the secondary market, um, which is pennies on the dollar of what these underwater loans are worth, and help refinance uh, homeowners into new loans that have equity. Uh, and this is uh, a concept that has gotten started in Richmond, but people are meeting um, even today in, in different cities around the country um, to spread this. Uh, and I think not so much because it would cost them money um, as because it's a chance for people to use the rule of law and democracy to impact the economy and impact banks' behavior. Um, uh, banks uh, like Wells Fargo have sued unsuccessfully and, and made all kinds of threats about redlining communities uh, in order to try to stop it. Um, people can go to fightingforclosures.org and learn more about that particular plan and get involved in that campaign. Kevin Whalen, you've been arrested outside of Attorney General Errol er Calder, um, outside the Justice Department, demanding more action. And yet, Linda Torelli, we have this latest news that is, uh, that the Attorney General claimed to have filed lawsuits on behalf of homeowners' victims for losses totaling more than a billion dollars. In fact, it was 91 percent less than this at $95 million. What do you think should happen? Who gets prosecuted here and who is let go free? I, I think that at this point, let's face it, we're never going to see a perp walk as much as we'd like to see one, because this is illegal activity that we're talking about. Um, at the very least, I think now this document gives the um, New York Attorney General um, free access to every attorney who's ever followed this manual and hold them accountable, because it is illegal. And we are held as attorneys to a much higher standard. We have to do a certain amount of due diligence, and we cannot knowingly produce false documents and submit them into a court of law. Our entire judicial, our entire judicial process is based on integrity. This document, as I read it, okay, is, is going to bypass the integrity of the entire system. And it becomes now the um, civil procedure rules according to Wells Fargo. And that's the rules they're willing to play by.
And more importantly, the author of that document, right? And who approved that document for well, all these lawyers e Exactly to use. right. Exactly right. And I want to point out that um, I actually introduced this document um, in, in a motion seconds. to uh, reopen discovery after a trial. And my hope is that we will get discovery and get someone to a deposition table and get the answer to that. Before uh, Eric Holder was attorney general, he was a senior um, partner at Covington and Burling. Uh, among the banks they represented, the four largest Bank of America, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. No shock there. <laughs> Linda Torelli, attorney representing clients being foreclosed on. Kevin Whalen of Home Defenders League, thanks so much for joining us. That does it for our broadcast. DemocracyNow.org is our website. Thanks to Mike Burke, Renee Felsar, Mate Nermin, Shake Steve Martinez. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks.